We are, of course, uh, when we talk clinical trials, it is not exclusively doctors, and that's a critical thing from the, the next two days. It is across a broad range of disciplines that uh, clinical trials are significant, and we want to look at one of those uh, disciplines now. Our next speaker uh, comes from the field of occupational therapy. She's prim primarily focused on the area of adult neurological rehabilitation. She began her uh, work with large clinical trials, and large is the operative word in this instance, with the Population Health Research uh, Institute, and she's currently co-investigator on both primary and secondary trials uh, for the prevention of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. She is um, from McMaster University in Canada, where she is Professor of Rehabilitation Science. Will you please welcome Dr. Jackie Bosch. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation and thank you to you for coming this morning to hear about trials across disciplines. I have to declare my conflict of interest. I'm sure as you listened to that very kind introduction, you thought, what's an occupational therapist doing large, simple trials in cardiovascular disease? When I got my master's in clinical epidemiology, I wanted to change the rehab world, but I wasn't quite sure how to do it. I had the book training, but not the real life training. At that time, a uh, guy, a guy named Salim Youssef was coming up to Canada to start a clinical trials unit. And that's when I jumped on the bandwagon and said, sure, I'd like to run a trial in cardiovascular disease events. What's a MACE? What's a major cardiovascular event? I learned a lot about MACE over the next 25 years. But here's my conflict. I know MACE is important, but I always thought function was equally important. The other thing I thought was funny is we talk about our multidisciplinary trials because we had cardiologists and diabetologists involved, thinking, hmm, could there be more to that group? So, an abbreviated timeline. I'm going back for a second in terms of clinical trials, the start, and where we need to go, I think. I will suggest to you at the end. There's debate about this, so give me a little leeway, please. But back in 562 BC, there was this military leader, a king, who did a trial, not randomized, of vegetables versus meat. I won't tell you who won, vegetables won. Um, and that, they say, was the first observational trial. Then along came James Lind, the first physician, so it said, one can argue that as well, who did a controlled trial, N equals 12, six arms, two in each arm. and. That was how the citrus fruit effect on scurvy was identified. 200 years later, 1946, Sir Austin Bradford Hill came up with randomization, a statistician working with physicians to improve the way in which clinical research was done, streptomycin and its effect on tuberculosis, a very important trial that led the way. He worked with another doctor named Sir Richard Dahl, who in four, about four years later, they put together an observational trial, recognizing the relationship between smoking and cancer. These, were, these changed the way in which we did clinical research. I'm gonna say that the next big um, breakthrough in clinical trials came in 1984, when Salim Youssef, Richard Pito, and Rory Collins put together the concept, or published the concept, on large, simple trials. And since then, at least in cardiovascular disease, that has been the way in which trials were done. Oh, Bill, I seem to have the same affliction that you do. There we go. Oh, I'm going to go back one. These were blockbuster trials. We are now able to do large trials with clear answers regarding the effectiveness of interventions. And yet, and you're going to think Bill and I got together on this, but here's a slide on the President's Advisory Committee on uh, challenges in cardiovascular disease. This is from 2019, but I'm going to suggest to you it hasn't changed that much. Interestingly, on this advisory committee was one Rob Califf, who is now the director of the FDA. Large missed opportunities at every step in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Now that had to be provocative to the president of the US at that time, maybe. First, I'm going to draw your attention to a failure to make risk factor modifications. People weren't being treated. Primary and secondary treatments that were effective in prevention were not being provided, and still are not. Next, failure to use proven first-line treatments. The estimates range from about 43 to 67% of those who should be on a statin are not. In, in those with atrial fibrillation, 
they're not getting a therapeutic dose of anticoagulation. And then failure to use advanced treatments. This group talked about PCSK9. I'm sure it's similar in Ireland. It's very expensive in Canada. People were prescribed but not given. You can figure out the reasons why these um, deficits are occurring, but nonetheless, they're occurring. I'm going to bring one other area to your attention. Failure to elicit and follow people's goals and needs. We're going to talk more about this, but this is basically the part that says, maybe MACE isn't the only thing that matters to the people with the disease states as well. So we've got the gaps. It's clear. Bill spoke about them as well. Why? I'm going to suggest to you it's because we've been answering research questions. We are now very good at creating a PICO type question. We know how to make the question right, but we don't know how to address the health problem necessarily. And that's pretty much what Bill was speaking of. So what do we do to solve the problems? We have to better understand the environments in which the treatments are being delivered. We need to involve people, all the people involved in care, in developing the question and the study. And then we, use to need, we need to use all the possible strategies to make sure practices get implemented. I'm going to show you an example of what we call the road to recovery. This is a diagram used in a province in Canada, Alberta, to describe the pathway, the road, for a stroke survivor after they've been initially diagnosed. They could be seen either in an acute stroke care hospital or a community hospital. It could go either way. We're not sure where people first present. Eventually, they, make, they may make their way to inpatient rehab. We then have the community setting. It could be home, long-term care, or supported living facilities. While there, they have appointments and transportations that they have to overcome. And then we have the community activities, early supported discharge, outpatient and community services, support groups, very big in the stroke world, as many may know, and associations, as well as usual community activity. If we think of these as points along the continuum, all points that could help us implement important interventions, it really broadens the people involved in ensuring the uptake of research. Here's a short list, and if anyone in the audience thinks, well, I should be on that list, I apologize. It's not meant to be completely comprehensive, but this is basically the people involved in the stroke care described on that slide. And incredibly important at the bottom, the stroke survivors. No longer are we doing research in the absence of the voice of the people who have experienced the condition. They are part of the team as well. So this all sounds good. It's great. She's standing up there saying, you know, did she really do the large, simple trials with this many people involved? No, but it's where we have to go. I want to show you an example if I can. There we go. Here it is. One of our trials that we did called OSCO. I've never presented to a group who actually knows the real meaning of the name, so that's kind of fun. You organize stroke care across income levels. You may see a young-looking person over there um, smiling who did have a little say in the uh, acronym. But here's the interesting part. First, I'm going to describe the team, then I'll describe the study. You see the people, and there, there's who they are. We had doctors, geriatricians, neurologists, epidemiologists, and statisticians. OTs, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and nurses. That is our study team. We have met every two weeks for the last, oh, we're getting on 10 years, nine years. And together, what we did was put together the first study. OSCL came about because in certain parts of this world where there are low resources, there are no stroke units. And in fact, disability in these areas post-stroke is incredibly high. Looking at the most effective care post-stroke, it's clear that stroke units, and that's the big tall bars in the middle, are actually twice as effective as our most effective medications. Now, those in the audience who are savvy will say, hey, wait, all those medications are administered in the stroke unit. And yes, you're absolutely right. This is a model. But what it does demonstrate is that when put together, the stroke unit effect is quite clear and important for, participant, for patients. So we asked the OSCO question, can we implement the key elements of stroke care in low resource settings? Not the stuff that requires a lot of med, uh, money, thrombolysis. We're not talking about you know, uh, treadmills even. Basic care, basic elements of stroke care. 
It was a two-phase pilot study, a small study, which I hope Bill will consider to be ethical by the end of my talk. Um, the pre-phase was determining what was actually being done. Maybe people were implementing these elements of stroke care, maybe. Then, taking the data, looking at the gaps, we could develop interventions together, all of us together. And then, after we uh, in provide the interventions, which was education, mostly in the, um, to the medical community, determine if we made a difference. The process was almost as important as the outcomes. Here's what I mean. Oh. This is a picture of our multidisciplinary training group in Rwanda. So you walk in, and it's all of us. So these are investigators from Rwanda, Uganda, South Africa, India, Canada, you get it. The whole team were here in Rwanda. This room, at the back, were the docs, two rows of doctors. Next, next layer was the physiotherapists, and then up front were the nurses. This was the first time those three groups had gotten together for any type of educational session ever. So you can imagine that multidisciplinary team activities was not high on the priority list yet. It was amazing to watch people start to interact. But what we recognized is we did it wrong. Very didactic. People were used to didactic learning in this environment. We provided didactic learning. When we went to Uganda, we said, we're going to do it differently. We're going to make people interact even more. Oh, you might wonder why there were no OTs. That's because the first graduating class was just graduating at the time when I was there. So there were no OTs, no speech language pathologists, nobody else. Here we are in Uganda, and we put people, I'm from McMaster University, we like to think it's a home of evidence-based medicine and problem-based learning. We can argue about that one too, but it's central to all of our educational activities, problem-based learning. So we said, we're going to put the Ugandans into teams, and we're going to d divide everyone up, docs, nurses, and physiotherapists. And we only had one of those for each group, but still, multidisciplinary teamwork in Uganda and you should have seen the difference. It was amazing to watch people work together. And what we found is that very quickly we recognized people knew what to do. I don't know if up-to-date is popular here. Or they, they were doing, they could, on paper, give you everything about guideline-based care. It was perfect. But re reality was not perfect. And we started having the discussions about why. And that was really key in understanding, could we implement key aspects of stroke unit care. Here are the results of the study. We had seven centers in total, four countries, as I mentioned. 436 participants in the observation phase, 396 in the intervention phase. And this is our small pilot study. We knew it had to be a pre-post study because in, research was new in these areas, and we had to introduce some concepts before we went for the main study. Our participants were 60 years old, I think likely younger than you see here, and definitely younger than we see in Canada. About half were women, and mostly ischemic stroke. A Little bit of a bias, because I'm thinking that the, those with hemorrhagic stroke died before most of our study team could approach. Mortality, however, 23% at discharge, another 13% by three months, and again, I think that's an overestimate of anyone walking in the door. We did see, statistically, significant improvements. It's a pre-post study, everyone's going to say, but at least we saw some positive things on swallowing assessment, independent toileting, um, pressure sore identification, mobility assessment, discharge planning, and multidisciplinary team care. Now, could it be that we just did a kind of Hawthorne effect where everyone went, oh, now I know what to look for in the chart. Could be, all of that's true. The bigger study is needed. But here's the other important point. At three months, disability remained high. And that is in an area where there is no treatment available for people in the community. More on that one in a moment. So, did we change practice? Are there now key elements of stroke care involved? No, no, not yet. But, here's why. Our design was wrong. Our design was good, but we needed to involve even more people. You're going to say stakeholders should have been involved in, oh, we had them all. We had talked to hospital administration. But really, what we need to do is in situ create the multidisciplinary teams that will address the health problem. As I said, in Uganda, every nurse knew why a glucose test was not done. 
and could describe. And then it was quite interesting because the nurses and the docs, we had to kind of stop discussion at one point because there's a little bit of a, no, it's you, no, it's you. So we need a little bit more mediation there, but I think we could develop a much better study. And in fact, the way to do it is, oh, that was our revolution slide. The way to do it is to look at a different design type. So for 25 years, randomized controlled trials have been the way I do trials. I like the other trials, I read them and I get them, but really, RCTs are what's exciting. And then, recognizing that our study would never change the way in which stroke care is provided, unless we went one step beyond, you started to think about the effectiveness implementation hybrid studies. So that implementation science that Bob was talk Bill was talking about, and the importance of embedding it within the trial. The problem is the sequential approach. That takes too many years. But if we do it concurrently, hmm, we get the two for one, two answers in one trial. And Curran, back in 2012, so this isn't a new idea, suggested there are three types. Type one, your primary question could be about your intervention effectiveness. You don't know whether it's effective. But your secondary is to understand the implementation context. So maybe it really is that novel intervention that you don't know about the uh, context in which it's going to be implemented. A type two trial, again, intervention effectiveness. But now we know a little bit more, maybe, a, uh, maybe phase 3B, feasibility and utility could be the implementation science secondary question. Phase three, or a type three, now you're really looking at the utility of the intervention. Can it be implemented? And what are the outcomes of, totali of the totality of implementation? You can see the progression, and it's kind of exciting. Let me show you an example of how we've been using this. I had said that from OSCO, OSCO still needs to be replicated in hospital. We need to do that randomized trial. It's coming. Well, we're trying to get money for that. And simultaneously, we recognize the need for community-based care. The Global Alliance for Chronic Disease, GACD, put out a call, and we created this proposal in answer to that call. It's a type two hybrid design where the intervention is the life after stroke center. This is the brainchild of Rita Melifonwu, a Nigerian nurse who we consider to be a force of nature. I hope one day you all get to meet her because she really does make you believe <laughs> that change can happen. The idea is uh, stroke survivors are identified in hospital and through community referrals. They come to the LASC, the life after stroke center. Not an opulent place, might I add, we're hoping for running water, at least in the one in Nigeria. Um, but the idea is the center exists that's easy to get to for most people in the region, in the area. And then participants get randomized, either to three months of intervention in Alaska, which is a multidisciplinary team intervention, or control, nothing. Because otherwise they currently have nothing. But after three months, they would then get their registration fees paid for the rest of the year for the Life After Stroke Center. So everybody gets something, but we get to actually study whether the intervention is effective. Rita considers this the only hope for getting sustained funding for this initiative. But simultaneously, we recognized you have to study the implementation. Because it's great that we can show in Onicha, Nigeria, this one Life After Stroke Center can make a difference. But she never started down this path for one center. She wants sub-Saharan domination of all centers. So it's quite exciting. We put as our method of implementation science the implementation research logic model. There are others out there. But the idea here is that you identify the deter Well, down in the middle box is the clinical intervention. What are the determinants of the intervention? The settings that are required, the participants that are required, and the processes that might affect its implementation. You then identify implementation strategies, the mechanisms to actually address those strategies, and study the outcomes. The exciting part is we're doing this overall because there are some commonalities across all settings. We're planning to implement this in Rwanda, Nigeria, hopefully Uganda, and India, and then ask each country to replicate this model for very country-specific and region-specific issues. If we can create these, and if we're, we've started, <laughs> we're partway through, great debates, we think that this will be an integral part of the next grant application because we can get right up to the part where we've identified all of the implementation strategies and the mechanisms for doing so, and now we're studying the outcomes.
So our grant proposal is for an effectiveness study of the Life After Stroke Centre and an implementation study on how it can actually happen long term. The GACD grant, it's Rita and myself who are co-PIs. It should be Rita who is the principal investigator, but the GACD wouldn't take a non-university professor as a principal investigator. Interesting for those in low resource settings and very difficult. So we are co-PIs. We have docs involved, we have more nurses involved, we have physios, we're looking for a speech language, if anyone's out there and interested, um, please let me know. Our GACD was successful at the letter of intent stage, I don't know if many of you have gone through the GACD process, but we had great hope, but we didn't make the next stage. And we think it's because we didn't have this aspect of our proposal, or the implementation science aspect, well developed. We're going to adopt this design in future, and it will be part of the OSCOL applications as well as the Life After Stroke Center applications going forward. So, trial methodology, we're, all, we're pretty good at that. We know how to develop or how to implement randomized controlled trials. We can elegantly answer questions. We can look at subgroups, important subgroups, very exciting aspects. But we haven't addressed the health problems. These remain and these need to be a focus of our research. I'm going to suggest the answer is through multidisciplinary research teams. You've seen the list of people, not exhaustive, that should be considered to be included on those teams. And those teams are going to reflect the integrated care needs and approaches that are currently being delivered in our health systems. I also think they'll, be they'll develop better questions one that resonate not only with researchers and acad academicians and clinicians and people who actually have the disease states. And I also think they'll be able to more quickly recognize barriers and strengths to overcome those barriers. Because in Uganda, once we started the dialogue going beyond who isn't doing what into who could be doing what, it was really exciting to hear what everyone uh, came up with in terms of ideas. In Canada, now I know, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go to Canadian um, sports analogies here. We have uh, hockey, very popular. One of our greatest hockey players is Wayne Gretzky. Not, he grew up not far from Hamilton. And he had a saying that he would skate to where the puck will be. And I think that's what today and tomorrow and the journeys ahead are all about, understanding and research where the puck will be. So I suggest to you, that where the puck will be is clinical trials that are designed and implemented by multidisciplinary teams using hybrid methodology. It's the way we're going to revolutionize clinical trials in the 21st century. Thank you very much.